Uh, today, literally today, a company that you may know hit a valuation of $3 trillion. The highest valuation for a company in human history history there are a few possible edge cases the dutch east india company was worth maybe seven trillion at the height of its power when it had a standing army and owned india <laughs> but that it was more of a government than a corporation as a regular private corporation there is no company that has outvalued apple at three trillion dollars and i want to give you a second to visualize what exactly a three trillion dollar valuation in 2022 means so i created this this is apple worth three trillion dollars that is worth more than the entire net worth of elon musk every single bitcoin in existence at the current market cap the entirety of walmart the entirety of target the entirety of boeing the entirety of coca-cola own every nfl franchise own nike own mcdonald's own disney and oh yeah you still have like 60 billion dollars left over that is the current valuation of apple apple is phenomenally phenomenally outside successful these are all successful companies and they are nowhere close to what apple has accomplished in the past decade and a half if you had bought apple stock when steve jobs released the iphone your money would have gone up like 5780 percent and there are many reasons for this uh one of them being you know this past year massive money printing by the government but in general uh the reasons for their outside market rewards and outside success is uh largely due to the fact that they have a world-class brand in fact they have consistently rated the best brand in the world the, the brand value of their company beats even mainstays like coca-cola disney mcdonald's they have the most valuable brand in the world so how did they get their brand to be worth so much more than everyone else's including other big tech companies that have you know massive scale and most people think it's advertising people think apple is better at advertising but in fact the data does not bear that conclusion if you look at the data it does not support that line of thought apple has had some great ads in their past to be sure but in fact if you look at it this is how much apple spent on advertising less than a billion dollars versus samsung 3.8 billion Alphabet, $3 billion. Verizon, $3 billion. Verizon, a company that's way smaller than Apple, spends three times as much on advertising as them. This is including digital ads, uh, commercials, etc. This is entirely all in. Alphabet is, is Google, if you're wondering. So, so how if they don't spend that money on advertising? And in fact, this number is actually going down. It's not like Apple is increasing. They're decreasing. Over the past 10 years, Apple has begun to decrease the amount they spend on commercials, advertising, digital banner ads, etc. And yet they've built a brand stronger than anyone else's. So this is where the YEP clock model comes in. Please give me your YEP clocks. And this divides all of the interactions that a, a customer has with a brand into three major sections on the clock. Pre-purchase, this is everything that happens before you buy the item. Purchase, this happens while you're buying the item. And this is post-purchase after you've bought it. And this could be anything from a service or a product or a good. And this, this pre-purchase area, is where traditional things like advertising has normally taken place. And if you look back to the marketing model of like the 60s, of the Mad Men era, it all relied around this. They did not care about this or this. It really relied on create a sticky, compelling advertisement, and then the rest will take care of itself. But that model has changed. The world of marketing has changed. For example, Nike is a, is a company that still is very good at this section of the clock. But other companies have attacked different areas to stand out from their competitors. Uh, Hyundai has an amazing warranty system, a, a world-renowned, often praised warranty system, and their, their cars keep their value longer than other cars. And because of that, this, this amazing post-purchase branding, they've built a brand as a company where you're you're more likely to um, not lose your money when you buy the car. You buy the car, it's, li it's likely to last a while, it's likely gonna be able to resell for a good value, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something they've built their brand off by focusing on post-purchase rather than pre-purchase advertising. Purchase. This is like in-store. It's like a great shopping experience. And again, Gap has stood out. From, this is more of an older example, but Gap has stood out from its peers in places like malls, which are all dying in general, by a better uh, in-store experience, a cleaner store, a better stand, a better display. Uh, but I want to talk about the ones that Apple is focused on. So Apple has completely deprioritized the pre-purchase area of the clock. They used to be a bigger advertising company, but they really have they've, they've cared less about this. And they've over-invested in these two areas and it has allowed them to massively stand out from their competitors. Okay, the money has gone from here to here. <laughs> because as a company, you can't do all of the things as well as everybody. You can't put all your money into everything. You have to prioritize. And Apple's slide to these two 
has made a massive impact on their success as a company and in fact led them to their three trillion dollar valuation is the argument i'm going to make starting with let's start with uh with purchase in 2001 apple uh, unveiled their very first apple store and they did it completely differently from established schools of thought they created an extremely expensive luxury temple to the brand if you go down Saks fifth avenue in new york you're going to see Gucci, Fendi, Prada, and Apple. They've, they've gone a completely different direction than other tech companies, especially at the time. And that has allowed them, I mean, this is one of the big, many things they've done, but the, the key thing that's allowed them to become a three trillion dollars company is that Apple is a company that sells the product volume, the amount of product of a company like Walmart, but they have the margins, the luxury status, and the price tags of like a Gucci. They are the only company in human history to have that uh, level of brand where they can sell at the scale they do, at the prices they do. So they created these um, these stores and these stores completely revolutionized this part of the clock, the purchase part of the clock. Previously, when you buy electronics, you would go to a place like Best Buy or uh, perhaps a poor online experience. First introduction to the product would be on someone else's terms. It would be on a Verizon terms, uh, Best Buy's terms, it would be on whatever's terms. It would be how they chose to display it. Apple chose to make these luxury, nice, high-end, extremely beautiful um, touch points for the first time you get to interact and touch a new Apple product. Uh, and, it, and it responded with greatly increased brand value. A comparison, remember how I said Verizon spends three times as much on advertising as, as Apple? An Apple store costs about $9 million to open. This is what I'm talking about, spending your money. This is what I'm talking about, shifting your money from here to here. Verizon spends a lot of money here. Apple shifted it down here. They spend $9 million nine to 12 million dollars opening a new store verizon spends four hundred thousand. a verizon store costs less than half a million dollars to open but it shows right the difference between this and this it shows you can you can 100 percent feel a difference as a consumer and that is where the extra advertising money has has gone instead of spending on advertising they're spending on better in-person purchase experience and this has led to a success like this so if you look at google search volume Apple store near me is more popular than supermarket near me, haircut near me, convenience store near me, and often, especially lately, church near me. <laughs> they I mean they're like temples. They are temples to the brand. They have people's attention and they have they have become a great way to get people to finally take the plunge and spend an expensive amount of money on a product. It sig signifies and conveys that they're worth the price tag. Second thing on the purchase part of the clock is packaging. So Apple has been uh, an outsized investor in packaging. Uh, this is Steve Jobs quote, you design a ritual of unpacking to make the product feel special. Packaging can be theater, it can create a story. That is not a typical tech CEO outlook, especially back in, you know, early 2000s when he was, uh, when he was saying it. The, the renewed focus on packaging, Apple has an entire division devoted just to packaging. They have a secretive packaging room where they have people just come in and open the package all day. <laughs> to test the experience and and it's noticeable okay when you spend that extra amount of money on an apple product and you notice the the diff difference in craftsmanship and and quality and and packaging when you open the iphone and open the ipad etc you are more likely to feel validated in your purchase it's less likely to feel buyer's remorse or regret that accomplishes things that perhaps spending the extra money on advertising and having a worse packaging might not Here's a great example that they have. This is an internal leaked Apple video uh, from the time of the iPod. So it's like 2000, you know, 2005 or six when this was leaked. This is them comparing their packaging to what it would look like if Microsoft designed the iPod. <laughs> this is an internal video of Apple de describing what it would look like if, if Microsoft designed the iPod. And, <laughs> and it's noticeable, right? It is a noticeable difference. Now, Microsoft in the recent years has learned from Apple and gotten better. Uh, their Surface stuff has gotten, they've, they've clearly stolen a lot from Apple in terms of like aesthetics and design and packaging. But at the time, this is very common and it shows what allowed Apple to get a massive head start in the tech space on being perceived as luxury and high end and, and different. They didn't do this. They, they made a conscious effort to really focus on making it top tier experience. So I uh, talk about purchase, talk about papers, Talk about post-purchase real quick. One of the things that Apple does differently in the post-purchase area that's also allowed them to get outsized brand value versus their competitors like Samsung, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, the Genius Bar. Again, the Genius Bar was considered a bad idea. P companies were shifting away from tech support. They were outsourcing tech support overseas or trying to find ways to not do it. And instead, Apple over-invested in on-site tech support called the Genius Bar, which is a crazy level of branding to call <laughs> to call it a Genius Bar and use images of Martin Luther King and John Lennon. It's, it's insane, but it uh, it worked. It worked quite well because when people spend a lot of money on a product, the fact that they felt they were given the appropriate level of service afterwards greatly increased their chances of becoming 
deeply embedded in the Apple ecosystem and buying again. Uh, Genius Bar usage of customer satisfaction. Uh, over 40% of users who have bought Apple products have used the Genius Bar, which is millions of million people. And 90% of them said they were very slash extremely satisfied after their visit. These are unheard of numbers. In the world of um, customer service, 90% saying they're extremely satisfied is an unheard of number. That is, a, that is an astronomically high number. And it's led to Apple having one of the highest NPS scores, which is a net promoter score, a chance of someone recommending the brand after they've used it to a friend in the world. It is one of the greatest measures of brand value. It remains significantly higher for Apple among their over, over their tech competitors. So them investing in the purchase and post-purchase areas of the clock have generated outsized rewards. Another area is that all of their products have what I have called the flex factor, which means they are very consciously consumable. When you see someone using an Apple product, it is a walking advertisement for their brand. That is the post-purchase area. It is impossible to use AirPods, iPad, iPhone, etc., in public without people knowing what they are. They, they, they stand out. Similar factor with something like a Tesla Cybertruck, okay? It's a product that doesn't need to pay for TV advertisement because people using it it is such a distinct form factor that's an advertisement. It's one of the reasons I believe that um, certain issues of the iPhone were underperforming because they didn't, you couldn't tell they were new. And that's why I think every new iPhone from now on will have something done with the camera on the back, some fucking new way of configuring the camera or extra cameras or whatever. So everyone knows that you spent money on the new one. <laughs> I think Apple has learned their lesson and made sure that, the, that every time they release a new expensive iPhone, there is some way that everyone can know that it's the new one, which, which again drives sales. And uh, this is an article saying, dear iPhone users, please don't forget that a green bubble is a real person. The green and blue bubble uh, thing is a part of post-purchase marketing that makes you feel more part of the Apple ecosystem. Once you buy an Apple product, you get access to the blue bubble club. <laughs> These are all parts uh, subtly on the clock. And anytime you interact with a brand beyond the clock that people don't think of as much, but they have a much bigger impact than spending extra money on TV advertisements. These things have done more to market the product than that stuff ever will. And Apple's overinvestment and really thinking about this type of the, this, this part of the clock has led to outsized rewards. So overall, in sum, you can sort of see here, all this post-purchase stuff, the Apple ecosystem, the green and blue bubbles, the genius bar, at purchase, they have a better store, they have better packaging. This focus vastly increased uh, market share and, and value, rather than having, again, a better advertisement than they used to have. They, in fact, have worse and less advertisements than they ever have. And But I wanted to say, this is just an example of the clock model. Again, the clock model is a way to think about any brand. And in fact, you can um, you could apply this to a brand like Tesla, which doesn't do almost any pre-purchase advertising. You know, they, they've created better dealerships. Car dealerships in general are a bad experience. Tesla dealerships are better. They have a better purchase experience, which makes their brand stronger. Post-purchase, they have uh, frequent updates for the car that add new random gimmicky things like, you know, holiday songs and et cetera, et cetera. This kind of thing makes you feel better about your purchase after the fact. Um, it's funny because car companies are so stuck in this pre-purchase mindset. Many car companies will run ads just to prevent buyer's remorse from their own consumers. It is a proven phenomenon where car companies will run ads not even to attract new buyers, but to make buyers that spent money on their car feel better about it. So they're just stuck in this mindset. And it's one of the most inexpensive and inefficient ways to do it. But this kind of ways have been effective. So, and, and you can apply this to almost anything, anything that requires money to buy. And so I've done a, a Twitch based example today. I want to bring up somebody I think we all maybe know, and that's Mango. <laughs> that's Mango. This is, this is Mango. If you guys know that, you know, I generally will get more viewers than Mango, but Mango has always sold way more subs than me. And in fact, Mango sells more subs than anyone his size. Mango has one of the highest sub attachment rates on all of Twitch. How does he do that? What is different about him? He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't shill for primes every every minute, like, 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 let's say a Ludwig speech. Ludwig has drastically, when he was on Twitch, this is different now, but Ludwig on Twitch invested in this area. He would do frequent uh, prime ad reads to a large audience. And that can work. But I think Mango is something a little different. When you purchase a sub from Mango, there is a much higher chance than, let's say, in my stream, that he will actually read it. And he's made a conscious choice, again, most streamers choose not to do this, to have loud, uh, impactful sound effects play. Mango, Mango, there you go. That stuff plays. Now, again, I choose personally to have no sound effect when a sub, because I think it distracts from the content. But if your goal is subs, then having a better purchase experience is important. When you buy a sub from Mango, you get an immediate visual and audio cue reward. You get your sub read. He remembers your name generally. Um, that's post-purchase. And um, you get an immediate sound effect. And it would be stupid to say this stuff doesn't have an impact on the sales. 
he sells more subs than most people. If you want to get more subs, you should learn from Mango. Mango's very good at it. And I think some of the things he does uniquely can be applied to this clock model. Again, post-purchase, after you become part of the Mango Nation, um, he remembers your name. He has created key cultural moments around his emo. Now, I think, for example, at the end of my stream, when everyone spams Aatrox 7, that has sold more subs than almost any other emo. People want to be part of that cultural moment, but I only have one. I have one or two. Maybe I have, maybe Sheesh was a thing for a while. But in general, emote cultural moments, I don't have too many of them. Mango has a fucking ton. Mango had Mango Banger. Mango had the big banana for a while. He's got a lot of these moments where you feel like you really want to be part of it. So whenever you buy the sub, you're suddenly immersed in this culture and you're spamming it and you're continuing part of it. So you want to keep it going. And then finally, he competes and wins tournaments. Uh, so after you purchase and become part of the Mango Nation, he rewards your faith often with high impact, high value sets. And it's one of the reasons I believe if Mango were to stop competing, he would actually see a significant drop off in subs, even though his stream would not change in quality. The fact that he competes regularly is a big part of his brand and it makes you feel proud to support him financially. Uh, you can apply this to almost anything. You can apply this not just to subs, to, to YouTubers, to um, to any almost business you interact with. If you were to start a business, you should think about how your customer interacts with you at all stages of the process. In general, I think the clock model is a way to think about marketing that is way more holistic and way more uh, intelligent for the modern times. You know, you could, you could put social media here, you could put influencer stuff here. So, in general, I think we'd like end with a massive yep clock spam and hope you learned a little thing or two about way to think about marketing through the clock model. <laughs> and that was that. It was a quick a quick and easy one, but I wanted to use Apple's $3 trillion valuation and uh, my friend Mango here to sort of explain a good way to think. I have made one of these for NVIDIA. I literally have thought about this at NVIDIA. This is not a this is not something I don't use. Please make one for AMD. Dude, AMD is a great example. AMD is a great example. I don't want to talk about NVIDIA just because I it's my work and I get into it, but... If you think about it, whether or not they upgrade their, their pre-purchase advertising. Yeah, this is it. Look at this. Learning a lot about AMD drivers right now. Let me tell you, I am not happy about them. That is the post-purchase experience. It is one of the things I think NVIDIA has over-invested in and it's made a big difference. Again, everyone complains about drivers for all companies, but NVIDIA drivers are generally better, generally easier to use and generally come out quicker. But focusing on that, creating a better post-purchase experience after you've bought an expensive graphics card is massive. So that's that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching Marketing Monday on the clock model.